Recording in progress. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today and welcome to our session, Gender and Economics. Without any further ado, please welcome our chair, Mr. Leonardo Burstin, to open the session. Mr. Leonardo Burstin, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thanks um, for, for uh, inviting us and, uh, and also thank you. I'd like to thank for uh, the attendees. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. This is a, a session on gender economics, uh, gender and economics. We have uh, a very, very cool lineup of papers. Um, so the first presentation is gonna be by Zoe Cullen presenting the paper, The Old Boys Club, Schmoozing and the Gender Gap. So Zoe, uh, you can uh, um, share your screen and, and we could get started. And now just count 14 minutes. Um, just for the attendees, uh, Questions are just put them on the chat and we're gonna just uh, get all the, the questions throughout the presentations at the very end, we're gonna have a few minutes and the speakers can uh, take a few questions if, if, uh, if they want. Okay, so let's get started. All right, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm gonna be presenting work that's co-authored with Ricardo Perez Truglia, who's at um, Berkeley at this time. And the two of us are <clears throat> motivated by this fact, which um, is persistent in many countries around the world. Women have a harder time climbing the corporate ladder. So as you move up the rungs of a corporation, fewer and fewer women will be represented in those positions. Um, this has been a fact that's persisted across decades, despite making progress in gender pay gaps within a position um, and in education ach achievement. And, um, and as economists, we also like to underscore here how this could be quite inefficient. So choosing among uh, half the pool for your CEO is, uh, would be less ideal than, than having adva taking advantage of the, of the women and the men. And we, I'm going to spend the, the remaining 14 minutes arguing that, that that statistic might be related to an observation um, that many of us have expressed, which is that workplaces are social. Employees will often take breaks with their manager. They'll have lunch together. They'll grab a coffee or a beer. And as a consequence, it could be that, um, it could be that the leadership at the top if they are predominantly men, and it, it, if it's the case that men who are more junior have an easier time socializing with the senior leadership, uh, we, it might be a case that the junior men have a leg up in, in, uh, in getting promoted. And this would be a self-perpetuating cycle because the, the male leadership at the top would become increasingly um, male as a consequence and, and it would continue like this. So the, the, the goal of the paper is to put some quantitative evidence around uh, the, 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 uh, the, in, the impact of that socializing on career progression of men and, and also people in general. So there's been abundant anecdotal evidence. Um, I, so I'm going to just share a little. There's a couple of surveys that have shown that the vast majority of women state that they feel excluded uh, in the workplace. And here, what I'm showing you is a picture of uh, the context that I'll be studying. So if you were to walk into this organization, which is a bank, you would see pairs of men like this uh, chit-chatting with each other. Um, and if we were to zoom in closely, you'd see that each one of these pairs is in fact a man who's holding a cigarette, which will become part of the identification strategy that we use. So as I mentioned, there's very little quantitative evidence on the impact that socializing might have on the career progression of employees. So in this paper, what we do is ask directly, do social interactions lead to faster career progression? And specifically, do male employees have uh, an easier time socializing with male managers? And does that impact how they proceed, how they get promoted through the, through the ranks? Ideally, we would be randomizing employees and managers to socialize with each other, and then we would track their career trajectories. 
what we're going to take advantage of is the fact that in this bank, despite the fact we don't randomize directly ourselves, there are rotations that managers make. And these rotations are part of their, the, the manager's typical career progression. So they'll switch from team to team uh, throughout the entire organization. And so we'll be tracking what happens when a manager of who, who, has a, who is a smoker is assigned to an employee who is smoking. And the smoking status of the manager employee you'll see is predictive of how, the, how many breaks they end up taking together. So just to preview the findings of this paper, um, we'll show that smoking employees paired with a smoking manager take more breaks together and they're promoted more quickly. It's unaccompanied by an increase in productivity. And, um, and then I'll argue in the second part of the presentation that the socializing contributes significantly to the male-to-male -male advantage that we see in organizations. So male employees that are paired with male managers experience a similar boost in the shared breaks um, that co-smokers do. And, uh, and this leads to a faster promotion rate. Um, and it can also explain about a third of the, the, the gender gap in promotions. So you can think about the unconditional gender gap in this organization. Uh, <clears throat> so if we were to shut down the, the male-to-male -male advantage that we identify, um, that gap, uh, the unconditional gap would drop by about a third. And then we'll show you that, in fact, we can shut down this socialization channel if we look at positions that are uh, geographically distant from one another. So, you, if we, if so, physical proximity plays a big role in the ability to socialize, and you'll see that it also shuts down this male-to-male -male advantage, as you would predict. Okay. So, I'm going to, because this audience is especially well equipped to. Uh, engage with the, the, the gender literature. I'm going to pass through this slide in the interest of time, but I'm happy to, to discuss it at the end. So the, 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 the contribution of this paper is to, to look at the impact of social interactions on career outcomes, which is, of course, of interest beyond just the gender gap. And I'm going to show you also that the social interactions is the mechanism for this male-to-male -male advantage. Um, and then another contribution that, um, that this paper makes is just the causal identification of the manager's gender on the, the outcomes of, of employees. So we're going to use uh, quasi-experimental methods to, to say something very causal about how gender impacts employee outcomes. So the context, as I mentioned, is a, is a bank, and um, the bank has asked to remain uh, uh, private. So the, all I can say about the bank is that it has thousands of employees and millions of customers. Um, it spans part, uh, parts of Southeast Asia, and in fact, because it operates in different regions with different cultural norms, we can see how the cultural norms mediate the male-to-male -male advantage. Uh, the smoking rates in this organization are, are actually happen to be identical to that, that, that which we see in the world. So 35% of men smoke and 5% among women. And we also see the typical drop in female career progression at a bank. In fact, this looks a lot like Bank of America in the sense that at the bottom of the teller and service positions, there's predominantly women. And as we move up, it quickly uh, drops off so that by get to the time you get to the C-suite, it's one in four. Um, okay. So just to let you give you some sample details, we're going to look at a panel from the beginning of January 2015 through December 2018, and we're going to track pay grade. So a, a one increase in pay grade is a 20% increase in salary. Um, so um, let me just quickly move on to uh, the results here. So as I mentioned, we're focusing on these rotations that are, uh, ex are arguably exogenous, that managers are sort of rotated as part of their career progression. And um, the, the, the managers that are rotated look largely like everyone else, uh, as do the employees who experience this manager rotation. We're gonna use co-smoking as uh, the shock to socialization. And this, you know, this organization, like many organizations, promote uh, these types of breaks. So this is the sort of like the, the roof deck of the bank is the most beautiful place and there's beautiful ashtrays to go along with it. Uh, this is what it looks like at eight in the morning. And then these are the types of interactions I mentioned. And the hypothesis is that when switching to a smoking manager, smoking employees are gonna socialize more. So first I'll show you that they do indeed socialize more and then I'll show you what happens to the career progression. All right, so the way we do the, uh, the analysis is uh, to focus on managers who uh, oversee employees who both smoke and don't smoke. So you can think about this top icon here is gonna be a, a manager who's a non-smoking manager and oversees two male employees, one who smokes, one who doesn't. 
And then this is going to indicate that this non-smoking non manager transitions to a smoking manager. And so this smoking employee has now experienced this manager rotation. We're going to compare smoking males uh, employees who experience this transition from a non-smoker to a smoker. And then because we don't want to identify just the impact of any old transition, we want to net out the effect that uh, this male smoker would experience if he had, a, he had transitioned from a, a male non-smoker to another male non-smoker. So we're always going to look at the difference between a transition of interest so to a non, from a non-smoker to a smoker, uh, minus the impact the transition would have from a, a non-smoker to yet another non-smoker. And then you can think about this final, this what I call the double difference is going to be looking at this differential effect on smoking employees, comparing it to what happens to non-smoking employees. <clears throat> the question we use to understand uh, the socializing is out of the last 10 breaks, how many were shared with the manager? And what we, you know, so this is an event study design. So you can look at the share breaks that they take in the period before the transition. And then you can see after the transition, what are the share breaks that male uh, smoking and non-smoking employees take? So on the left-hand side before the transition, smoking employees and non-smoking employees uh, have a similar answer to the share breaks they take with their manager. And then after the transition, um, you can see that the smoking employee is now a 27 percentage point boost, which actually is a 53 percentage point uh, increase in the socializing time that they spend. And then we can look at what happens to the career progression. So leading up to the, the transition, you see that the smoking employee has a similar path uh, when they are about to transition to a smoking manager. <clears throat> relative to a, just a, a transition to yet another non-smoking manager. For this, the non-smoking employees, it's a similar trajectory. And then you can see after this transition, the smoking employee's career path increases. Um, and then the non-smoking employee's path, career path remains on a constant uh, uh, pay grade path. So this is what the double difference looks like, the, just the difference between those two lines. And then to give you a sense of magnitude, um, by the time you get to the 10th quarter, um, the smoker employee is going to have a 15% boost in their salary relative to the non-smoker who have tr transitioned to a, a smoking manager. And now I want to spend the very last minute just showing you how, the, how similar this is to what happens when a male uh, is paired with another male. So let me just switch to this um, this, the gender results, you can see it's the exact same setup as the smoking analysis. So a, a female switching, a female manager is now gonna be replaced by a male manager. And we're gonna net out the effect of going from a female manager to yet another female manager. And we're gonna compare what happens to men and female employees. So on the left-hand side is the graph I showed you for share breaks for smokers. And on the right is the same graph, but now you can see for a male employee that gets a new male manager, they experience a similar boost in, um, in the share breaks that they take. So this is gonna be a, a, a 20 percentage point boost in the, in the share breaks. And for women, actually the manager's gender makes no difference at all. And we also see that for the male employee leading up to the transition, they have, uh, they're on a steady career path with women, and then afterwards the male trajectory takes off, with, whereas for, for women it stays uh, constant irrespective of the gender. This is the double difference. We can now look at the reverse transition. So I, this is the uh, reverse transition here. So you can see from going from a male to a female, the male starts to do worse relative to the men who get another male. And then let me just, uh, so the, if we were to do the back of the envelope calculation, um, this would be a 13% male to male salary advantage after 10 quarters. If we shut it down, uh, we reduce the gender pay gap by 40%. And um, to just conclude, I wanna show you that what we, we do to think about mechanisms is look at uh, productivity outcomes. So this is, this is the difference in log days worked. So you can see it's pretty flat, irrespective of the gender of the, the manager who, who you just switched to. Uh, this is the hours worked, used swiping in and out of the building. This is the sales revenue. Um, and so our, our interpretation, um, our interpretation of this is that, um, in fact, it, uh, it's unlikely to have affected the. It's unlikely to have affected the productivity of the employee, even though it's affected the promotion. So um, it's only true in high proximity positions. It's not true in low proximity positions. So this is where the employee and the manager are separated from one another physically. Um, and now I'm just going to conclude. So this is, these were the two parts of the paper that I showed you on the left, the smoker's career trajectory, on the right, the male-to-male -male advantage. Uh, we think both are mediated by uh, socialization. 
So um, thank you very much. I know that I'm, we have very limited time. So let me just leave this conclusion slide up for the, for the interested reader and uh, I look forward to the rest of the presentations. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you so much. You actually had 40 seconds left. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> wow, amazing. Yeah, it covered a lot of material. Uh, thanks uh, for this great presentation. Uh, I think we, we can continue now uh, with, um, we're going to have Heather Sarsons uh, presenting work on interpret interpreting signals in the labor market evidence from medical referrals. Um, Heather, whenever you're ready, you can start. Uh, okay, so yeah, thanks so much for including me uh, in this session. Um, this paper uh, is looking at how we interpret information about other people's skills and abilities. Uh, and the motivation for the paper came from thinking about kind of gender differences in, in career progression. So in a lot of industries, women are not just kind of hired at lower rates, but also promoted at lower rates. They tend to move up the career ladder more slowly than their male counterparts. Uh, and so in this paper, I kind of want to think about what goes into the employer's decision about whom to hire, whom to promote, and so on. And so we think that that's going to at least in part uh, depend on how an employer interprets information about um, a worker's skills and ability. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, um, you know, an employer is going to get information about a worker in terms of the work they do, uh, past references, and so on. Uh, and if there are differences in how employers interpret information about men and women's ability, how they interpret these signals, uh, this could lead to gender gaps in labor market outcomes. Oops. Uh, so in the paper, I use data on medical referrals from physicians to surgical specialists to look at how a physician's referrals change after they refer a patient to a surgeon and the patient either does well or does poorly in the surgery. Uh, and I'll talk more about what I mean by that in a minute, uh, but the context to have in mind is so a, a patient sees a physician, the physician decides that patient is going to need a surgery, and so they're going to refer that patient to a, uh, a surgical specialist. Um, I assume that the referral choice, at least in part, reflects a physician's beliefs about a surgeon's ability, so they're going to refer the patient to someone they think is going to do a good job. And then I'll look at how the physician's uh, referral choices depend on the outcome of that surgery. So if the surgery goes well, do they continue to refer to that person? If the surgery doesn't go well, do they switch to someone else? And does that decision depend on the, the gender of the performing surgeon? Um, so in terms of these medical referrals, you can think of these as cases where a physician's patient needs surgery, and so they're gonna be the one who's choosing the, the surgeon to refer the patient to. Uh, these are all scheduled procedures, so there's no kind of randomness in how these are allocated. Um, and there's a little bit of evidence kind of looking at how physicians make these uh, surgical choices. Uh, and for the most part, it's uh, what physicians say is that they want to maximize patient outcomes. Um, so they want to refer the, the patient to someone who's going to do a good job. Um, there's other stuff that goes into it, like wait times and so on. Um, and those are some of the things that I can test for in the paper to see if that's driving the result. Um, so just quickly on the data I use, um, so to capture these referrals, I use data from uh, Medicare, which is a large uh, government provided insurance scheme in the US. Um, so this is a 20% random sample of Medicare beneficiaries. So I essentially end up with a, a panel of accepted patient uh, referrals from a physician to a surgeon. Um, data on physician and surgeon characteristics, so things like their gender, age, experience, and so on, are taken from a data set called Physician Compare. And then I use a geographic data set called the Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare that defines um, what are called physicians hospital referral regions. Uh, and these are areas kind of within which a physician typically makes their referrals. So you can use this to get a sense of what a physician's options are for whom to refer the patient. Um, for the, this presentation, I'll focus on new physician surgeon relationships because this is really where you see the results. It's kind of very much in line with a learning story where if I've been referring someone to a patient, uh, patients to someone for a very long time, I don't much react to this information. It's only when I've just started to refer a patient to someone. Uh, okay, so I look at two types of events. Um, the first are what I call bad events. So these are cases when a patient dies within seven days of a surgery. 
Um, for good events, I take the top 1% of the riskiest patient procedure pairs. So these are um, surgeries with a very high risk of complications. Um, and I'll call this a good event if there's no death or hospital readmission within 30 days of the procedure. Um, so there are a lot of differences between male and female surgeons. They tend to select into different specialties. Uh, men tend to see more patients and riskier patients and so on. So to deal with these differences, I use a matching strategy. Um, so I do a course and exact match where I'm gonna match male and female surgeons on things like the specialty they're in, the procedure that's being performed on the patient, um, as well as the number of patients that the, the surgeons have received uh, in the past, the surgeon's overall experience, information on the characteristics of the patient who's referred. Uh, so importantly, things like the patient's uh, predicted risk of complications or death, um, as well as the physician's outside options. So I'm gonna be comparing two physicians who both have the option to refer to say, you know, three heart surgeons or something like this. So I use this match sample then to run an event study where the outcome of interest here is the quarterly number of referrals going from the referring physician J to the performing surgeon I. I'll look four quarters before and six quarters after one of these good or bad events occurs. And I'll interact that event with an uh, indicator for the surgeon being female. Uh, so that this coefficient gamma is gonna tell us about the differential reaction of a physician that depends on the gender of the performing surgeon. Um, so the assumption I have to make here is that I've captured selection on observables to identify the effect of gender on a referral change. I'll also look at what would have happened in the absence of one of these good or bad events. Um, so here I'll match surgeons, uh, female surgeons to other female surgeons um, who perform the same surgery, but whose patient um, in the case of a bad event does not die, or in the case of a good event um, has some kind of complication and is rehospitalized. So this is gonna help us to kind of benchmark the size of these effects. Okay, so I'll start by showing you um, the referrals going to these surgeons who do not have, I'll start with the bad events. So this is what I call kind of the placebo surgeons. Um, so here the uh, surgery takes place in uh, quarter zero. Uh, these are all normalized to the number of referrals going between the referring physician uh, and the performing surgeon in the quarter before the, uh, the surgery takes place. Um, so you can see that the, the physicians are referring an increasing number of patients to the, this surgeon, uh, and then it kind of levels off over time. Uh, bringing in the, the uh, surgeons who have a bad event then, uh, for the male surgeons in the blue, you can see that after a patient death, they start to receive fewer referrals per quarter relative to what they would have received in the absence of this bad event. And bringing in the female surgeons, you can see that um, they also receive fewer referrals per quarter in the absence of a bad event, but there's also this gap now between how the male and female surgeons are being treated. So women are actually getting about 0.25 fewer referrals in the post period relative to what they received in the quarter before the bad event occurs. Uh, switching to the good events, uh, so here you again see the referral path for people who had the expected out outcome. So in this case, uh, it's people who, for the most part, their patient is rehospitalized after, you know, a kind of riskier surgery. For the men who have a good event occur, you see this like level shift up in the number of uh, referrals they're receiving. And for the women, you also see a level shift up after they have one of these unexpectedly good events occur. But again, there's this kind of gap between the number of referrals that the men and women are receiving in the post period. Uh, I also look at whether physicians change their behavior toward other uh, male or female surgeons who are in that same specialty. So I'll run the same kind of event study, uh, but here the outcome variable is the fraction of the referring physician J's referrals to group G, so either male and, or female surgeons who are in the same specialty as the surgeon who did the surgery, but excluding that surgeon. So for example, um, say that a physician refers to a female surgeon A, who's a heart surgeon. I'll look at the fraction of their referrals that go to other heart surgeons who are also female um, after female surgeon A experiences one of these patient deaths, controlling for the fraction of available surgeons in that specialty who are male or female. 
Uh, so in the blue, this is looking at what happens to the uh, referring physician's referrals to other male surgeons after a death under the care of one male surgeon. Uh, and you can see there's kind of no uh, significant change in their referral behavior toward other men. But in the red, you can see that, you know, there's this drop in the number of referrals or the fraction of referrals that the physician is sending to other uh, female surgeons in that same specialty. Okay, so this is just summarizing these results. Um, I can also look a bit at the career implications. So here on the outcome, uh, on the y-axis rather, the outcome is a standardized measure of patient risk. So you can see in the post period, uh, similar to how the physicians start to send fewer referrals, they also start to send the women less risky patients. Uh, and if we look at risky procedures or procedure risk, you can also see in the post period in the red, women are starting to receive less risky procedures as well. This is now looking at the impact on Medicare payments um, from the referring physician to the surgeon. And you can see that it kind of tracks what we saw with the referrals where there's this drop in the number of, uh, in the Medicare payments. Uh, so the income of the surgeon uh, in the post period after a death. Okay, um, so overall we see that female surgeons lose more patients after a bad event uh, and that this spills over to other female surgeons. Uh, and why I think it's kind of important to think about this and document this behavior is that if women have fewer chances to make mistakes, you can think this can lead to lower skill accumulation, especially in a field like medicine where people learn by doing. Uh, if women are not just given kind of fewer procedures, but they also get less risky procedures, then they kind of have less of a chance to learn and build up their skill. And when we think about the, the wage gap uh, between men and women, which is kind of an off, uh, a commonly used metric to measure gender inequality, this is measured conditional on the skills, industry, and position that people have at a given point in time. But if there's differences in how people are evaluated leading, leading up to that point, um, then you know this could mean that we're kind of missing a lot of women who could have reached those positions if they had been evaluated in the same way as their male counterparts. Um, okay, so I leave it there and uh, thanks again for having me. Thank you, Heather, thank you. Also, uh, you finished ahead of time, so I guess we have uh, more, more time for discussion at the end. Um, but uh, uh, perfect, thank you. So next, we're gonna have uh, Siri talking about It Takes Two. Uh, gender differences in group work. Um. Thank you so much. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, okay, let's go. Let's see. Just want to make this large. Okay, why isn't that working? I'm trying to make this large, but it's not doing it. Okay. All right. I don't know why it's not. Maybe a view. Uh, full screen. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for this invitation to present in this excellent uh, group of experts within this field. Um, so I will talk about uh, my paper, It Takes Two Gender Differences in Group Work, which is actually uh, a number of papers at this point. Um, looking at whether there are gender differences in claiming credit uh, for uh, contributions to successful group work. So this is something I've been thinking about since 2016, basically. And it uh, goes into the, a lot of the ideas that have, or, or it speaks to the same types of topics that have already been mentioned, like why don't women uh, progress in their careers as much as men or as we would expect given, you know, equal ability and so forth. And so the idea that I had here was that the fact that we work so often in teams these days, so almost every career includes some sort of teamwork, may actually be perilous for uh, female career progression since if we compare a situation in which you work on your own to one in which you work in teams, it immediately becomes unclear who contributed what in the team. Whereas if you work on your own, of course, it's clear that you made 100% of the contribution. So we can think of that, for instance, in this uh, in an example that we're uh, very uh, familiar with, with co-authoring versus solo written papers. So if I write my own paper, it's really clear from finish to end or from beginning to end that 
you know, this was my idea and I did everything on the paper. And so, of course, I'm going to get all the credit for the paper. However, as I start co-authoring, you know, people may attribute the credit to whoever presents the paper the, the most or speaks about it the most or what have you. So this was kind of the idea that I started out with, thinking about those situations in which we worked in teams where actually, you know, people observing us may not understand who contributed what and may rely on claims of credit to kind of attribute credit. And so what I wanted to understand was, first, is there a gender difference in claiming credit for the same contribution? So do women claim less credit for the same contribution in teamwork as men? And second, like, do these claims matter? So if you're kind of a manager trying to attribute credit for a successful project, are you going to listen to these claims? And is there a gender uh, discrimination in, in attributing credit? Uh, and I should say, of course, Heather has done extremely important work here where she shows that, you know, women, uh, female co-authored papers with men um, receive less credit on their on their tenure evaluation. So I do think that there's, you know, evidence out there that we should be worrying about this. All right. So in order to test this, um, I had to kind of come up with an own new framework. Um, so that's kind of one contribution of the paper is introducing a way in which we can measure various types of group work. And so what I did is, because I wanted to have a way of knowing as a researcher, what is the actual contribution and present my definition of contribution to my subjects and then say, okay, given my definition of contribution, how much do you think you contributed? So what I came up with was this puzzle, which is a sliding puzzle. And um, I had people in the Harvard Deci Decision Science Lab solving this together in pairs. So people were sitting in two different rooms. And our task together now would be to uh, slide all these tiles in numerical order. So in this particular case, I would be working together with Maria, uh, and this would be her actual picture and her actual name uh, taken in the lab. And so we would be taking turns in sliding these uh, tiles. And the neat thing is that I can read this puzzle with a breadth first search algorithm, which tells me how many moves remain on the op optimal path to solution. And then for each move that me and Maria make, that's either going to be a good move in the sense that it moves us closer to the solution or a bad move in the sense that it moves us further away from the solution. And so what I do then is I sum over the vector. So every, every move that me and Maria make is going to be an entry into a loose vector. And I sum over that vector. And my share of um, good moves is what I define as my contribution. So after we're done working with this puzzle, if we manage to solve it together, a question pops up asking, you know, you managed to solve this puzzle with Maria, how much do you think you contributed to the solution? And so I incentivize that question such that you should always answer according to your true contribution. Okay, so unlike the real world, there's no incentive here to overclaim. I mean, we can imagine in the real world that there's a reason to state that you did more than you actually did, right? But that's not the case here because I kind of wanted to pit the odds against myself. Um, and so what I see first is that um, women and men are equally good at this puzzle. So they contribute equally and every performance measure checks out. So that means because of the way that this is incentivized that we should expect that men and women also claim equal credit, right? but they don't. So women claim less credit for the same contribution as men. And then a secondary result in this paper is, well, um, since if I move, for instance, four here, and Maria knows, or if Maria moves that, and I know that this is a bad move, then I can reverse that in my next step. So that's corrections, which is a secondary outcome that I look at. And I see that, again, despite this equal ability, uh, women actually correct less than men. So uh, in the follow-up paper, which is the first time that I'm presenting today, so I'm very excited to hear your thoughts about this, I wanted to look at, okay, so now I have all these claims, I have uh, the way that they work together, I have all this data, like a huge data, or not a huge, but a data set of 505 solutions together with moves, claims, contributions, and so forth. What about if I present that to other people? So I re repeat the exact same experiment, but now instead of solving the puzzle, you come in as an evaluator. And then I can check, you know, do these claims matter? How do we attribute credit and so forth? So, um, in 2019, I started this study again at Harvard Decision Science Lab, where what I did was I had people come in as evaluators. So now they view this puzzle, uh, the real solution that I collected the year before, uh, they view them on their screen, the real moves, and there's four between subjects treatment variations. So um, in one treatment, you saw no information at all. So you would just see player one and player two, and then we add on information. So um, in, in the claims treatment, you don't see that you don't know anything about them except for their claims. So these are the real claims that these players made for their contributions. 
And then we have one treatment where we see the picture and the name. So now the gender is known. And then in the fourth treatment with the most information, you actually see the picture, the name, and the claim. And so what I can see then is between these four treatments, do women get more or less credit? Do people listen to claims? So like, do claims matter, right? Like, because of course, it, the whole point here is like, when you work together in a team and you have a manager who's trying to attribute credit, like that person is gonna have a very hard time often monitoring who did what. And so if someone speaks up and claims credit, you may actually rely on that. So that's something I wanted to test here. Um, so this is just to show you kind of the experimental designs so that 400 subjects entered the lab. Each subject was randomized into a treatment. We, here are the four treatments. Um, and then they were randomly given five out of these 505 solutions. And so since I have uh, 400 subjects, that means I have uh, 4,000 evaluations in total. And um, so for each subject, you kind of attribute credit for player one and player two. And I didn't think this true, or I didn't realize this as I was designing the study, but what happens is if, you were, if you've attributed credit for player one, you've efficiently attributed the credit for player two too, because it sums up to 100. So for the purposes of this presentation, I'm gonna focus on player one's credit, like how much uh, credit uh, player one gets from an evaluator. All right, so... Um, just to start off with some summary statistics, what you see here is uh, just uh, average breakdowns of uh, how much each of these players uh, contributed, how much they claimed, and what they were attributed. And so the first thing to note is that um, this, in this randomized selection of the puzzles that were shown to, attribute, uh, to evaluators, unfortunately, there is a gender gap in the contribution. So remember in the real data, women and men were equally good, but here it's the case that women just by random selection contributed a little bit more. Um, it is good though that we see that the claimed credit gap is here. So we do observe that um, men on average claim more credit than women in those puzzles that were randomly selected. And we see just a small average gap here on attributed credits. Um, so men on average get 50.6% and women get 49. But these are all, pool, all treatments pulled together. So then <clears throat> breaking this down by uh, treatment, uh, this is just the average credit attributed to player one when player one is a woman working together with a man. Because again, where they they attribute credit to two players, right? So if you have two women, you can't really discriminate. So I just wanted to check what happens when you're working in a mixed team to give you guys an idea. So what I see then is that, um, interestingly, women get women working with men get the most credit when they're in the claim and gender treatment. So now evaluators know both the claim and the gender as uh, communicated by the picture and the least credit when there's the least information available. But of course, <clears throat> as we saw, there's, uh, gender differences in contribution and so forth in this data. So next I turn to regression control. Um, so here I've run um, a regression on the credit attributed to player one, uh, which of course ranges from zero to 100. And I've controlled for the contribution of player one and the claims that player one did, and then the claims and contributions that player two did. And then um, I have dummies for uh, all the different teams using male, all male te teams as a baseline. Um, and then it's split on the four um, treatments here. So the first thing that I think kind of stands out that's interesting is that it really does not matter at all how much you contributed. So as you see here, the contribution of player one to this puzzle is completely irrelevant for evaluators. And I think that's interesting because that was kind of the idea that I started with, that when you work collaboratively in this way and someone has to observe it, perhaps it's the case that, you know, uh, evaluators can't really pick up on who's doing what. And that's kind of what I'm seeing here. So the second thing that I wanted to know was, okay, well, do claims matter? So can I kind of increase the credit that I get by claiming more credit, right? And what I see is that in those treatments where claims are known, um, so um, column two and four here, it's actually the case that um, evaluators do give more credit to those that claim more credit. And then um, a third kind of interesting thing is that um, as my partner starts claiming more credit, I actually get less when uh, genders and claims are known. So by claiming more credit, I get more, but when my partner claims more, I get less basically. And then moving on to the um, gender composition of the team and how much credit you get. 
Uh, I wouldn't pay too much attention to this because of course this is female team. So if you give more to one woman, then you're gonna give, uh, or if you give less to the player one woman, you're gonna give more to the player two woman because it's, it sums up to 100. But what we do see is that when player one is female and player two is male, so in mixed teams, uh, women do get six percentage points less credit, but this is when there's no information. So uh, this is kind of a puzzling result and it's quite interesting because it means that they're picking up on gender, the evaluators, but they're doing it through some sort of... Um... Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, is there a question? Uh, just... Um... I guess there was some background noise, but um, just uh, if you could wrap up in the next minute, We're running out okay, of time. Okay, yeah, of course. Okay, so this is interesting because what we see is that evaluators are picking up on gender through some sort of play or something, but um, okay. Uh, all right, so um, I just wanted to show you this too. So we saw that claims actually translate into the credit that you get. And this is just showing the relationship both for men and women. So I think it's quite interesting that both men and women can increase the credit that they're attributed to speaking up and claiming credit. Um, so with that, I just wanna conclude and say that it seems that gender matters in group work, both for how we credit ourselves, but also for how we credit others. And importantly, claims can increase the credit you get when working collaboratively, whereas actual contribution does not seem to matter at all. And then moving ahead, um, I wanna look at um, so I've rated all the pictures on various uh, visual attributes, so how mas masculine you look and so forth, and that seems to uh, be very important for how you attribute credit to. And I also want to understand like why women are discriminated and no information treatment. So is it that you know they work in a different way or something like that? Um, yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Siri. Thanks. Um, uh, now let's get to the last presentation by Michaela Carlana. Um, um, it's going to be uh, a new paper, actually, Parents and Peers, Gender Stereotypes in the Field of Study. Thank you so much, Leo. Okay. All right. So. Perfect. Let's get started. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the big motivation, so this is actually, let me say, this is like a joint uh, work with uh, Lucia Corno. Um, and so we uh, start from the big motivation that there is uh, gender segregation in uh, uh, the field of study and in the choice uh, of like a, a student and like the occupation uh, of males and females that is pretty um, persistent across most OECD countries. And it may lead to uh, long-term adverse, uh, adverse consequences, uh, not only for uh, female, given the underrepresentation of women in science, but also for men, if they are not picking up to the subject they uh, prefer the most, where they could be more productive at, but for the society as a whole. So in this project, what we try to do is to study the role of parents and peers in creating these gender barriers in the field of, cho in the field of choice. And we try to understand whether like uh, uh, the actual uh, gender stereotypical choices that we observe are actually are induced by uh, the um, different like influence that the parents and peers may have. We try to do that in a lab in the field experiment, collecting data from around the 2,500 middle school children. Uh, we try to simulate the actual uh, choice of the field of study by forcing them to choose within our lab in the field experiment uh, between a male type task, uh, math, and a female type task, uh, literature. We collect uh, several other measures um, uh, from these uh, students, including their friendship network, the implicit association test to measure their implicit stereotypes, but also explicit gender stereotypes and academic interests. We tried also to survey their parents, but with little success. So uh, I will focus mainly on the um, on their uh, because of like low response rate from parents. So I will focus mainly uh, on the results here uh, from the student survey. Uh, so the experiment is actually pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, before we ask them to select the field between math and literature, we expose them uh, randomly uh, to one of five uh, like different treatment plus a control. So in the first treatment, we ask the child to think about their mother recommendation before they actually choose between, uh, uh, the, between math or uh, literature. 
In the second treatment, we ask them to think about their father and what would the, uh, their father recommend them uh, to choose among these two fields. In the third treatment, we try to understand whether actually is uh, uh, they are worried about this choice being revealed by their parents. So whether like this is what is actually driving the result. Um, and finally, the last two treatments are to get at the role of peers. So the fourth treatment, we inform the children that at the end of the experiment, they will be divided into two groups, uh, depending on the subject that they choose. So substantially, their peers will be able to observe whether they choose math or literature. This goes in the direction of actually uh, some uh, work uh, Leo and the co-authors contributed to. We wanted to understand whether uh, girls like uh, are just like uh, at this like young age are already like acting, not uh, uh, being willing to uh, uh, somehow like reveal their most ambitious uh, uh, choice related to uh, the math field. The last treatment uh, gets at uh, the interaction uh, potential uh, channel. So we told the student that they will be divided into groups and they will have to collaborate and interact with the classmate that choose the same subject. This is somehow to resemble what happens in the actual choice of the field of study when you pick a combination of like your, uh, the subject you're going to study, but also the classmate you're going to interact with if you are stuck with the same group of people that actually choose your same uh, field. Um, so let me very briefly show you some description. Let me show you very briefly some descriptive evidence. Um, so here what you have is actually the choice uh, between math and literature. So here is a dummy if you choose math. And we find that 63% of boys actually choose math and like 43% of girls choose math. And interestingly, even if this was a lab in the field experiment, this is highly correlated with the high school they wanted to do, uh, the overconfidence in math and literature. So it seems that they were really replying in a, uh, a nice way and also is highly correlated with the implicit association test with boys that associate more math with their, with their own gender, choosing more math, and girls that associate math with boys are choosing less math. So this seems to be like very consistent. Um, so they, I will show you the main results are coming from a very simple regression in which we have these five treatment arms. The randomization was done at the individual level uh, for these 2,500 uh, kids. But for simplicity, I will first show you the results of the first three treatments on like the impact on the uh, parents' treatment. And then we will focus on the uh, peers' treatment. Um, before we go and see the results, let me uh, show you a little bit what part of what the children think about their parents' recommendation, because we collected this information. And this is very relevant because we wanted to understand what is activated for uh, children when they think about their mother or when they think about uh, their father recommendation. So overall, we find that 50% uh, of boys and 44% of girls, when they think about their mother, they think she would advise them in, uh, uh, to choose math. Well, like uh, uh, for uh, fathers, this is like the, on average is a 67% for boys and 62 for girls. So overall, the pattern is when you think about your mom, you think more uh, about, uh, uh, so um, if you're a girl, you think more about literature. If you're a boy uh, and you think about your dad, you think more uh, about uh, um, uh, math uh, as a recommendation. But what we find particularly interesting is that even when we control from, for the performance, uh, and how good these kids are in math or literature, we find that the results, the gender gap in the perceived recommendation from their parents is still present. So the, independently on how good these kids are, they still perceive that their parents are pushing more uh, girls to the uh, female, uh, to the literature, uh, if they think about the mother, and boys uh, to STEM if they're thinking about their father. So this is just descriptive evidence. So let me just jump on the main result of this uh, uh, paper. So first, on average, this is what we find. So the, the first graph on the left is for girls. The graph on the right is for boys. Um, so the, uh, the, these, uh, the, you have like the bar for the mean uh, for the control group, and then uh, the mean for treatment one, treatment two, and the treatment three, where, let me remind you, treatment one was the one in which a student think about their mother recommendation before they actually choose uh, their own field. And treatment two, they think about their father be before actually choosing uh, their track. 
So what we find is that uh, mothers seem to matter a lot for girls. So on average, if you think about your mother before you're choosing uh, your field, girls have like a substantial drop in their probability of choosing math. Um, there is like a, nothing at least a statistically significant going on for the other two uh, treatment arms. And for boys, everything seems pretty flat. However, something that seems very relevant is whether you think that your mother would recommend you math or your mother would recommend you uh, to literature. So here it would be very crucial to go and see the heterogeneous treatment effect on how this uh, effect is, whether this effect is driven by uh, the gender, the, the parents that recommend the gender stereotypical subject or not. So this is like uh, the average treatment effect. When we go in depth and see, we have this information on the perception collected ex post um, on the mother recommendation for both like the treatment uh, groups and the control uh, group. So we can somehow split the sample uh, depending on the perception of the parental recommendation. And what we find is that if you're a girl and you believe your mom recommend you math, there is no difference between the treatment group and the, the actually being assigned to thinking about your mother uh, before taking your decision. All the fact that we were finding before was completely coming from those girls that perceived that their mom, mom would recommend them, the gender stereotypical subject, the literature. So for these girls, their probability of choosing math goes from uh, uh, almost 40% uh, to less than 20%. So there is a 50% uh, decrease in their probability of choosing math by simply thinking about their mother before taking their own uh, decision. For boys, there is nothing statistically significant, even if they seem to move a little bit in the direction of like the uh, parents' suggestion, but this is like not statistically uh, significant. Uh, uh, interestingly, let me jump uh, uh, directly here. For um, the father, we do the same exercise with the father recommendation. And we do find that even if on average there was no effect on boys, we do find that boys that believe their dad would recommend them math, the gender stereotypical subject, are reacting to the treatment and they are saying that they want to do more math. So here, the bottom line from this first set of results is that the children tend to react and choosing the more gender stereotypical subject when they are prompted to think about the same gender parents that have like a more stereotypical views pushing them uh, to the gender stereotypical uh, subject. So the second set of results that are coming actually from the same regression is uh, uh, in the effect of the influence of peers. So on average, again, we first start with the average treatment effect, splitting the sample uh, between uh, boys and girls. And we do find, again, a zero average effect for boys and girls that uh, are not like statistically significantly affected by the peer public uh, treatment. So when they are aware that their, um, their choice will be observed by their classmate, there is no effect in terms of like their actual choice. However, when they think they have to interact with uh, the people that choose the same subject, we find this like a substantial drop in their probability of choosing like a, a math. So we try to go on and a little bit as we did before, investigate from which part of the distribution this gap is coming from. Uh, and in particular, we collected exposed information and beliefs about uh, uh, the, um, how many uh, classmates, male and female classmates, would choose uh, math and literature. So somehow, like, we can split the sample between uh, the students that believe that they will be, uh, girls will be a minority in STEM, or whether, like, the students that believe that girls will be equally represented or uh, a majority uh, in STEM. So when we split this sample, we actually find that there is no effect for those girls that, no effect of this interaction uh, component for those girls that think that they will be like uh, 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 equally represented uh, in math. So there will be at least like as many girls than boys uh, in choosing uh, math. So in this interaction uh, task, they will be not a minority. And we find that all the effect is coming from those girls that believe they will be a minority in uh, the gender stereotypical, in, the, in math. So substantial, there is a, this is a substantial drop of these girls that if they think they are a minority in math, they are not going to enter uh, that field. So they will shy away from, uh, from STEM. 
Um, so the reduction here um, is, is pretty substantial, uh, and it goes from 45% of girls choosing math to 27% uh, of uh, uh, girls choosing math uh, among these uh, uh, that have more male peers in the STEM field. For boys, uh, we have nothing like a statistically significant going on. So this component of like the interaction is uh, fully driven, um, is, is there only for girls and only for girls when they know that they are going to interact uh, with, uh, uh, with boys. So to sum up, the second uh, result from this paper is that uh, girls shy away uh, from math when they believe they will be a minority in the uh, male type uh, field. Um, or alternatively, we have a sec another part of the paper in which we show that uh, we have also the friendship network. So it, the fact is actually um, could be uh, uh, driven also by the fact that you have less female friends that are choosing math. And so you're shying away by the uh, field in which you will have no uh, friends. So let me conclude. So in this experiment, we showed two set of results. So the first one is, uh, uh, was on parents. And we find that uh, if you're assigned to, if you think about the same gender parents with uh, gender stereotypical views in the field of study, you are pushed uh, to enter more uh, the uh, literature task or the math task uh, if you are uh, respectively a girl or a boy. And second, the second result that we believe is very interesting is that there is actually no uh, effect of the public treatment at this age. So for these uh, children that are around around uh, 14 years old. However, we do find that they are shying away from being a minority in, uh, uh, in the, the girls are shying away from being a minority in the field. And this is as deep implication for those countries that have high school tracks in their system as a, a, the Italian context where, that we are studying. So somehow from a policy perspective, uh, it would be very important in terms of like application, emphasizing that um, and trying to like mix up the, the tracks or trying to emphasize that at least you will be in the same building with like a, a more uh, equal representation of boys and girls, because otherwise we may have like less women in STEM simply because they don't want to interact with uh, uh, boys, but not because they don't want to study STEM. Um, okay, uh, I'm done. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Michela. Very, very nice. Um, we don't have a lot of time left. Um, just wanted to see, I actually had a few questions on the desk. I know it's gonna make it. Uh, let's see if, uh, I want to do this. Uh, there is maybe if 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 you could answer the question if any of the questions from the chat you want to ask uh reply on the chat feel free to do it or if you want to take uh any of the questions um um i have just i have a couple of questions so michaela just, so you sorry just a clarification question uh was the the perception about parents was that measured afterward Yes, in it a was different not in a different. I see. Okay. At the end of the um, experiment, we collected that. Sorry. At the end of like sorry, the sorry. experiment. Oh, are you here? Uh, it was collected at the end of the experiment part. I see. I see. Uh, do you have measures? I know you collected the IAT. Uh, a bunch of people have you collected from the parents because that could be interesting to write to see how parents' implicit bias predicts the treatment effects, right? Because then. You know, because you're asking a question after the experiment and, you know, there yeah. some, some effects of the experiment. Have yeah, you thought about that? So we collected also the IAT of parents, but it was like a very small sample. So we have like 400 parents and it is very noisy. So we, we don't find like anything like statistically significant. The IAT has a lot of noise inside. So when you go in these small yeah. samples you are not picking up much so that's why like in the paper we use the student IIT so we have both uh, and we are using the student IIT because we have that for the entire sample and we I don't have to cut it down to 400 observation with like six treatments this was like a, it was not great um, but yeah. yeah because it would be nice to get that measure so uh, the question now for Heather Heather uh, uh, you know from Zoe's paper and also from Siri's paper, the, the aspect of interactions and uh, and men going out there and talking and, you know, claiming credit. Um, so do you think, so just to check, so to, 
to rule out that the some part of the effect is basically men being more proactive at, at talking to other men and just say hey explaining or or claiming credit for the success or, or blaming uh, is, is 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 it right to look at the effect that he has on referrals across the board in the gender is is that the way to 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 think about how to rule it out because it, it seems like you know um that could be a good way right just to see if I'm yeah i think yeah exactly so when you look at the kind of one-to-one -one referrals i think i can't rule that out um i think it's harder to explain why you see an effect on referrals to other women then um yeah. if it's kind of driven by but but yeah i agree it could be the one-to-one -one is partly because men are have like informal conversations explaining what went wrong or something like that i see cool i was just trying to connect the, there's this connect potential connection across the papers uh awesome good uh, uh i think we're out of time uh i just, uh do does anyone want to ask any question have any final considerations I have a quick question for Carlo, uh, Michaela, sorry. <laughs> I'm always citing you in the, by the last name, so this is, <laughs> but <clears throat> here you are. So, um, and perhaps this is a, a question that Leo will find interesting. Do you, do you know um, of the women who, of, of, the, of the girls who you ask what share of men they expect to end up interacting with? And is it on point? Um, yeah, so this is a good question. Uh, so it tend to be, um, so I should like double check that, but uh, I think they were on average like overestimating uh, the number of boys uh, that were choosing uh, uh, math. But there could be some interesting variation mm. actually. Uh, you, <laughs> you gave me like a very good idea. There could be uh, some interesting uh, variation to exploit for those that were correct in their guess and like those that were not correct in their guess. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, I think it's, that could be very cool. And Zoe was right. <laughs> I like the question. But I think, you know, it, it could be stuck right there if you, if you, if everyone could be self fulfilling, right? If you think that it's going to be just men and you don't do it because of that and then end up being more men and, and, and then you observe it. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Cool. All right. So I think, um, I think we're out of time and, um, and, and for those in the US, this is 4th of July. So uh, appreciate you attending and um, during the holiday. Um, uh, all right, thanks. Uh, I, I guess we, we could end. Uh, oh, I think there was a, there are a couple more questions. Uh, all right, so fortunately, we, we're gonna have to wrap it up, but uh, thanks, thanks. I'd like to thank the panelists. This is, is a very, very cool set of papers and I uh, hope to interact with you all in person in the near future. Thank you bye. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Recording stopped.